if we come back to the question around trying to you know repair an injured tendon like you mentioned and how that that micro trauma you know doesn't want to take up the the load per se unless you put it in a certain situation i mean i've heard you speak about different isometric exercises you know is this where performance staff and rehabilitation staff should be focusing on when we're thinking about that return to play yeah i really think that early on especially um even if there's an uninjured individual if you've got your 18 to 22 year old basketball player and all they want to do is play basketball and that's great and they're going to have that you need to do things that are going to be able to mitigate some of the plyometric load that they're under so they're going to have achilles they're going to have patellar tendon they're going to have jumper's knee they're going to have these issues that are going to arise because they're going to get these micro traumas or these little bit of things where the tissue doesn't perform as well okay and once the tissue doesn't perform as well if it's weaker well the strong part is going to get all of the load and we just we just had a paper come out um, the final version just came out today where basically what my PhD student did is we put a hole in the middle of a rat patellar tendon because that's really kind of what it looks like when we take a basketball player and we look at their knee on an MRI, you can actually see these little holes right at the bottom of the patella. So you have the kneecap here mm -hmm. right underneath it where you, you can imagine it's trying to come to this little very small uh, tibial plateau at the bottom. And so it's narrowing quite quickly. And that little area right at the base is where you get a lot of problems with this anterior knee pain or patellar tendinopathy. And what you see is almost a hole. And in fact, a lot of people for years have been saying, treat the donut, not the hole, when they're talking about these injuries, mm -hmm. because they didn't think you could fix the hole. The hole was going to stay there. Yeah. And we basically just thought of why you were getting that hole. And the reason that we thought you're getting a hole is because if I take a tendon cell and I start compressing it a lot, what it's going to do is it's going to stop making the genes that it was making when I was pulling on it, putting it under tension. And it's going to make different genes. And the genes that it's going to make are the genes that you would find in cartilage because that's what happens to cartilage. It gets compressed. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you have in cartilage or you have these proteins and these, these glycoproteins, protein sugar combination, and what they do is they hold water because if you're getting compressed, you want to have some water in there so that it basically decreases the compression. And so if you think about that little area of the knee right at the top, right in the middle of the patellar tendon, as I pull on the tendon and make it skinnier, it's going to actually compress that area. So if I have a little micro damage in there and instead of it being loaded in tension, now it doesn't feel the tension because the tension is going all around it. But it yep. is feeling compression because the sides are being compressed. And what we found is that when we took um, these rat patellar tendons, we put a hole in it. We did, uh, we did transcriptomics, and the transcriptomics were almost exactly the same as you would see in human tendinopathy. Incredible. So we compared it to a former study that was done where we could see that the gene expression changes that they saw in human tendinopathy were almost exactly the same as we saw in the rat. So that was great because that validated using the model. And then we did an exercise and we either did dynamic exercise like running, jumping. And that was basically 360 contractions, but very short. Yep. Or we did four isometrics that were 30 seconds long. And we, we worked it out so that the time under tension was exactly the same. The length of the loading period was exactly the same. The only difference was whether you were pulling and holding or whether you were dynamically pulling and, and relaxing. The ones where we were doing the dynamic load, we looked at gene expression in the, in the injury site. They have more type two collagen, which you would find in cartilage. So basically we're seeing compression when you're doing the dynamic stuff. When we did the isometrics where we pull and hold, the gene that identifies cells as tendon genes, this gene called scleraxis, it went up. Collagen one, the gene that's normally found as the, as the backbone of a tendon, Gene expression of that went up, whereas in the dynamic one, it actually went down in that scarred area. Wow. And so what this tells us is that if I've got somebody who's always doing dynamic loading, and I know that if I looked at an MRI, I would see signs of degradation or signs of uh, abnormalities within the, within the tendon, within the matrix, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some isometric exercises. And right now, what, we, what we're suggesting is this program of four times 30 seconds, 
if you've got a known injury. Mm -hmm. So I would do basically do an overcoming isometric. So a lot of people, I've talked to basketball teams where they're like, I never thought I was going to bring a, a leg extension machine into our gym <laughs> ever again. And dust it off. Yeah, because they were all about functional movement for so long now, but injury rate was continuing to go up. Now they brought in this the leg extension. So now you're going to put the pin at the bottom. You're just going to try and do a leg extension. You extend, hold it for 30 seconds. Going to relax for two minutes. You're going to do that four times. That's if you've got a known problem. If you're trying to do um, something that's going to prevent injury, I'm going to go out, have my practice, play my game. Then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to do an isometric, one of those extension isometrics on both knees, 30 second hold, bang, I'm going to do that. And what we find is people recover faster after the game because it seems to be helpful for both the tendon and the muscle. Interesting. And they don't develop the same increase in stiffness over time they can lead to further injuries within the structures. Incredible. And it's amazing how that can be done, you know, during obviously off season, in season, this is going to be complimentary. And like you said, this ideally we sh this should be part of a, a training plan full stop. Now, like you mentioned, in terms of being able to cover all these areas rather than waiting until we have a problem. Exactly. And that's what we talked about at the beginning. Cause if, if the strength coach knows what the athletic trainer is doing the athletic trainer knows what the goal of the strength coach and the other coaches. Now what you can do is you can coordinate and say, here's what we're trying. Cause you don't want to sit there and say, you go to the athletic trainer and they've got this really heavy load that you're doing these really slow isometrics. And this is at a period of time where the strength coach is doing all this plyometric load to try and increase stiffness, increase performance. If the two individuals who are controlling that part of the training plan, don't communicate, don't have that unity in what they're trying to do. You're going to be fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. One of them is trying to do one thing, which is exactly opposite adaptation to what the other person is doing. You don't know, you know, simple things like providing, oh, yeah, you're going to do this whole big training thing to try and improve some quality of the muscle. And then we're going to stick you into an ice bath or we're going to stick you into a Normatec and we're going to decrease the stimulus that you just did that was designed to have an adaptation. That, that you just basically got rid of all the hard work that you just did on that athlete. So mm -hmm. that's why these things have to be really well coordinated because if I don't know what some other member of the team is trying to do with this athlete, I could negate every bit of the work that they're doing simply by, you know, whatever my contribution is. Yeah. It's easy for individuals to get focused on their area, obviously, isn't it getting stronger rehabbing and that communication between even if it doesn't feel like trenches or silos it sort of ends up being that doesn't it absolutely absolutely and so that's where the beauty of some of the you know where you see good organizations who are working together really well so i've done a lot of work with uh with these guys lesser tigers for years and rugby team and we've got a, a case study that we're doing right now on somebody who ruptured their their um hamstring muscle because again, as you get into these positions where you're leaning forward at the waist and, and your leg is fully extended, huge opportunity for rupture in there. Yeah. And, you know, surgical repair. So they, you know, they're working with the doctor, they're working with the nutritionist, they are working with the PT and the strength and conditioning coach, all of them working together, setting up this plan and getting an athlete back from a rupture, surgical repair, getting back in 10 weeks to, to, return to play within the team. And then, you know, first rugby at, I think it was 10 or 11 or 11 or 12 weeks following surgery. Um, and it's not just somebody who's going to kind of run around in the background, score to try on the first two games, wow. all of the, that stuff that you get with it. If you can coordinate those things, you can do really impressive things as far as getting athletes healthy again and, and really helping them to recover from any injury, but also recover to a performance level that's going to be at or above where they were before they were injured. And, and those yielding isometrics, if we come back to some of the strategies, you know, are those incorporated alongside the overcoming isometrics to achieve, you know, just what you outlined there, or, or is that a progression? Yeah. So what we would do in that, in the case where we have a significant muscle tendon injury is we wanted to, you know, it was a bit of a, 
back and forth between the surgical team and, and our, our side of things. Because surgical team was like five to six weeks after surgery before you move. And we were like, let's load tomorrow. So what you have to do is you come to compromise. So we loaded it seven days post-operative. And what we do is we use these, what we call low jerk isometrics. And so what you do is ramping isometrics. So you can do it in any position. And basically you just slowly develop force over about a five second period where you slowly are activating the muscle because what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize jerk. Mm -hmm. Jerk is the rapid change in, in, in length of the muscle or the tendon. Mm -hmm. We know both from eccentric loading, if you do fast eccentric load, the rate of muscle injury is higher than if you do slow eccentric load. Same thing is true at the level of the collagen. We can actually denature collagen based on the rate of, uh, of extension of the tendon. So all we're doing is we're slowly moving into the movement so that we're protecting it. We're holding the movement. We're holding the isometric for 20 seconds. We're slowly letting the, the force off. Mm -hmm. We can start those as early as the next day after surgery. In this case, the case that I told you with where we got them back to return to play with return to practice at 10 weeks, that was seven days after surgery to, to get them to the point where they were doing that. That's great. What we can now do is now that we've had it seven days, no, no detrimental effect. And if anything, we got back about a month faster than they were expecting. So now oh. what that does is it buys you a little bit more credibility for then saying, let's try this <laughs> next, next time. time at three days. And then when three days works out even better, then what we can do is we can say, let's start loading, you know, right after or pretty soon after the next day, basically.